Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Michael Wald and I'm thrilled that you're joining me today for this edition, this podcast entitled The Mind's Blind Spots, Unraveling Cognitive Thinking Errors. You're listening to Ask the Blood Detective and I'm Dr. Michael Wald, the original blood detective. I practice clinical nutrition and holistic therapies in Chappaqua in Westchester, which is located an hour north of New York City. You can reach me with your comments or any show ideas you might have at 914 552-1442, or you can email me at info at blooddetective.com. Certainly check out the website if you want to find more podcasts or other free information that I think you'll find very useful. You can use the search bar uh, at www.drmichaelwald.com. That's drmichaelwald.com. Okay, let's get into the mind's blind spots, unraveling cognitive thinking errors. And I call this blind spots because most people are absolutely unaware that they are making thinking errors. And they then assume that the problem is outside of them and that they have no particular cause or role in the matter. So what are cognitive thinking errors? Well, first of all, they're also known as cognitive distortions. And there are systemic errors in our thinking that can affect our perception of things, our understanding of things, and certainly our decision-making. And a very important aspect of cognitive thinking errors that you must know is that you're, we're usually making these thinking errors and we're completely unaware of them. So my proposal to you is that if you can become aware of your cognitive or thinking errors, you'll make far fewer of them and you can live a more sane and happy life. And once you get used to identifying your own thinking errors, at the same time, you'll be seeing thinking errors or cognitive distortions in everyone around you constantly. And by recognizing and addressing these thinking errors, I say a person can become happier, much more productive, and have far more, I would say, uh, sane relationships, whether they're in a personal, let's say romantic relationship or working relationship, you name it. If you're aware of your cognitive distortions, then you can alter how you view the world through those distortions because that's how we see the world, through thinking errors. And these errors can lead to inaccurate and irrational thinking and can adversely impact again, our relationships and our overall well-being. What you need to know is that cognitive distortions are patterns of thinking, and a pattern implies that they recur, 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 and they reinforce themselves, and these cognitive distortions by reinforcing themselves reinforce what they call brain neuroplasticity, the physical structure and the biochemical structure of the brain, including neurotransmitters, are adjusted as these cognitive disorders stay around. So we become physically and emotionally and energetically predisposed to these cognitive errors if we're not aware of them. If we are aware of them, we can know that they're cognitive errors and then we can adjust our thinking accordingly and that further changes our brain's ability to respond to that. And then the structure of the brain changes in a way that supports the recognition of the cognitive errors and replacing those cognitive distortions with rational, sane thinking. So what we also now know is that cognitive errors significantly impact perceptions, our judgments, our interactions with others, leading to failed relationships, miscommunications, misrepresentations, wrong conclusions, and the triggering of feelings that spiral out of control as we react to these cognitive errors. Said another way, cognitive distortions are often automatic and unconscious that bring themselves into our conscious world in terms of our conversations that distort reality. So they arise from underlying beliefs and attitudes and assumptions that we hold about ourselves, others, and the world around us. And these cognitive distortions can and often do negatively influence our thoughts, our emotions, 
our behaviors, ultimately affecting our relationships and, of course, our overall well-being. So if we're talking about thinking errors that are impacting how we're thinking and behaving and, and all of that, I think that these are big enough issues, uh, as, as important as any physical issue, to get a hold of. So let me outline for a moment some of the ways in which these thinking errors can affect our lives. So one way cognitive distortions can cause, let's say, failed relationships is through the distortion known as mind reading. So mind reading occurs when we assume that we know what others are thinking or feeling without any concrete evidence. This obviously goes on a lot of times because during, in, during my, my days when I'm doing life coaching with clients, uh, mind reading is a very predominant cognitive distortions and people are quite surprised when I point out to them that they are practicing this mind reading cognitive problem. And then these individuals suddenly realize that they were acting out of a fantasy. They were assuming that they knew exactly what the other person was thinking, but then when their rational mind kicks in, they feel foolish. Uh, and that's not the point of recognizing cognitive distortions, not to make you feel bad about them, but to be aware of them so you make them make these cognitive errors less often. So the, the mind reading occurs, as I mentioned, when we, we assume that we know what other people are thinking or feeling and, and we don't really have any evidence that we're right. So this mind reading distortion leads to misunderstandings, miscommunications, because we might act based on our assumptions rather than seeking clarification or open dialogue. For example, if someone is quiet, let's say during a conversation that you're having with them, you might assume that they're upset with you without considering other possibilities such as maybe they're tired, maybe they're distracted, maybe they just got a cancer diagnosis, um, maybe their, their child is ill, but we make the assumption that no, it's not that. So this can create tension, obviously, this misinterpretation and strain in relationships because it fosters a lack of trust and understanding. Another cognitive distortion that uh, I believe contributes to relationship difficulties is the one known as black and white thinking, also known as dichronomous thinking. And this distortion involves perceiving situations or people in extreme terms or all or nothing without recognizing the shades of gray in between. Black and white thinking can lead to misinterpretations, wrong conclusions, because it oversimplifies complex situations. For instance, if a partner, let's say, forgets an important event, someone engaging in black and white thinking might conclude that their partner doesn't care about them at all. So this distortion disregards the possibility of forgetfulness or other factors that could explain uh, the behavior. Another extremely important cognitive problem uh, is overgeneralization. But before I go into that, these cognitive errors sometimes have advantages. So for example, if you had a trip to Africa and you had a close encounter with a lion, uh, it would be a good cognitive strategy for your brain to say all lions are dangerous uh, so that you can protect yourself. So the cognitive era of overgeneralization, for example, or black and white thinking, all lines are this way, can have an advantage. But when we use these cognitive errors unconsciously, many of them tend to be misused. Let me explain what I mean in terms of overgeneralization. So overgeneralization is, again, another very co common cognitive distortion that can contribute to relationship difficulties. I see quite a lot of this in my life coaching practice. So overgeneralization involves drawing broad conclusions based on limited evidence or just a single negative experience. Someone will say, well, I saw an acupuncturist and it didn't go well, so I don't go to acupuncturists. And of course, in my holistic field, I see people who say that they have gone to their physicians, their medical doctors, and it didn't work out, so they don't want to go to their medical doctors anymore. So let's get super clear on what I mean by overgeneralization. So again, it's another cognitive distortion that can create all kinds of issues with uh, work, with personal relationships, of course, with one's 
perception of reality. And overgeneralization basically involves drawing broad conclusions based on very limited evidence and, as I mentioned, or a single negative experience. So this distortion can lead to a negative bias and the expectation that similar negative experiences will occur in the future. I had one person I was doing life coaching with that said, yeah, I had a very traumatic divorce with my um, my husband, Michael, so uh, I, I stay away from men with the name Michael in my dating. <laughs> and um, I'm sure that most of you listening to this sees how illogical this is, how one Michael is not every Michael, just not like one person of a particular religion is everyone in that religion. I think you get the, uh, you get the gist of that. So... For example, if someone has been hurt in, the, in a past relationship, they sometimes may overgeneralize and believe that all future relationships will end in heartbreak. And then they bring that notion to the next generalization and then they wonder why, or the next relationship, and they wonder why things turned out the very way that they thought it would. They'll say something like, I knew that would happen. And they don't realize that they most likely caused that to happen because they walked into the relationship with that attitude. And everything that occurs in a relationship, in a partnership, will be uh, placed upon that filter of negative overgeneralization. So obviously overgeneralization can lead to avoidance of relationships or it may sabotage, uh, sabotage potentially healthy connections due to these unfound fears. And overgeneralization limits our ability to see the subtle nuances and unique qualities of each situation, hindering our capacity for growth uh, and connection. So it, it should be pretty easy to see that cognitive distortions can trigger feelings that spiral out of control because they often involve emotional reasoning. So emotional reasoning occurs when we base our beliefs and judgments solely on our emotions without considering objective evidence or alternative perspectives. I pointed this out to a, a life coaching client of mine and uh, pointed out to her that uh, she uses largely emotional reasoning and she said that she prided herself on being emotional without recognizing that the filter of emotionality will tend to exaggerate feelings uh, or events or happenings in a relationship, uh, which again can spiral out of control. Another example would be if someone feels anxious about attending, let's say, a social event, they might conclude that something terrible will happen even though there's no cr concrete evidence to support their belief. So emotional reasoning intensifies our emotions and can lead to self-perpetuating cycles of negative thoughts and feelings and hyper-reactions. So imagine two people that have varying opinions on, let's say, something political. The emotional person would hypercharge their feelings and project on the other person all of this negative emotionality as opposed to the emotional person being more logical and saying, oh, okay, we don't agree on this. That's fine that we don't agree. I really like to understand your thinking. Why do you think that way? Something like that. So in all areas of life, cognitive distortions can have detrimental effects on our well-being and certainly our decision-making processes. I, I've seen it absolutely ruin lives. So these cognitive mistakes lead to self-fulfilling properties. Like I mentioned before, if someone, for example, looks at the world as being prejudiced, let's say, or against them, then that is what they tend to see. And they will hyper-exaggerate examples of when they thought a person was, let's say, um, treating them the way they knew that people treated them. Um, and again, by projecting these emotions onto these people who may have no ill intention whatsoever. So it's, it's clear that these cognitive distortions can lead to self-fulfilling uh, prophecies, I should say, uh, where our distorted beliefs shape our behaviors and interactions in ways that confirm these beliefs. So someone has a belief, again, that, 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 that uh, let's say everyone with red hair doesn't like them, and then they make that assumption, and then one day someone with red hair says something that 
this emotional person, let's say, or this person with this uh, generalizations about red-haired people might think, and then they say, ah, I knew it, I knew it. So they turn it into a self-fulfilling prophecy. Meanwhile, all of us have examples of when we don't get along perfectly well with other people, but if it happens to be uh, mixed in with a, uh, a cognitive distortion that particular types of people don't like you, the, you filter uh, your life and then you when these people are in your purview and they're in your, uh, you know, when they're close to you, you have interactions with them and they fulfill on this, it tends to reinforce in that person's mind that their generalizations uh, were true. Another example of this is when, for instance, uh, someone believes that they're unlikable. They might act in ways that push others away, reinforcing their belief. So that individual will become usually neurotic, have neurotic behaviors. They tend to be disagreeable people and they tend to globalize. And this is their evidence that their beliefs are true, although they don't realize that their truth, they are looking through that truth through a cognitive distortion. And cognitive distortions are bad in other ways uh, when used in extremes because they can contribute to what's known as rumination, which is the repetitive and obsessive thinking about negative experiences or perceived failures. So rumination prolongs distressing emotions and it prevents us from moving forward or finding solutions to problems. It clouds our perceptions in a negative context and reduces our ability to, to hear and to properly perceive others appropriately. And the other problem with rumination, you know, when you ruminate on something, it just goes over and over and over. So again, it's this repetitive, obsessive thinking, generally of negative experiences. And as the person ruminates, they, they structurally change in the nervous systems and, and physiologically as well. And they become hardwired for rumination. So to overcome cognitive distortions and their negative impacts on relationships and other areas of your life. It's essential to develop cognitive restructuring skills. So cognitive restructuring involves challenging and replacing distorted thoughts with more accurate and balanced ones. This process requires self-awareness. You have to know you're, you're doing the cognitive distortion. Uh, critical thinking. You need to be able to sort of stand outside of yourself, stand outside of the emotions and say, is this logical? Is this reasonable? Does this help me? Is there any evidence for this feeling? And this process of self-awareness and critical thinking and willingness to question our automatic thoughts and assumptions is what is absolutely necessary to get over these cognitive distortions. So as I continue speaking about different sorts of cognitive distortions, what I want you all to think about is, is what I just said a few moments ago, that you want to be mindful of the process of cognitive restructuring, which involves replacing and challenging distorted thoughts with more accurate and balanced ones. And as you do this, it'll become easier and easier for you. And again, this process must uh, and, and, and essentially requires self-awareness on your part and critical thinking on your part, challenging why you respond and think the things that you do and have that willingness, willingness to question your automatic assumptions and your thoughts. Here's another uh, cognitive distortion, which is extremely common. Uh, it's known as confirmation bias. And confirmation bias is the tendency that we have more or less, to seek out information that confirms our pre-existing beliefs uh, or ignores or discounts information that contradicts these beliefs. If you filter everything through a confirmation bias, all you're listening for is things that are in agreement with you and you consciously or unconsciously just discount aspects of new information that do not believe, uh, do not agree with you. And another, another really, really important cognitive distortion is what's known as anchoring bias. So anchoring bias is the tendency to rely too heavily 
on the first piece of information we receive when making decisions, even if it's not accurate or irrelevant. Some people make these quick decisions based on initial information, and then additional information comes in and they're like, I'm not interested. Or they subconsciously are like, well, I've made my decision. So this is not thinking. This is reacting. Reacting by definition is not thinking and takes no time. If you find that you've made decisions about things instantly, you probably are suffering from cognitive distortions. Not always, but usually. And then there's what's known as availability bias, the tendency to overestimate the importance of information that is readily available to us rather than seeking out a more diverse range of information. And in my field of natural health, uh, a client might say to me, Dr. Wald, I stopped taking the iron you recommended because I read that it was dangerous and it could cause cancer and, and, and inflammation. And I said to them, you're deficient in it, so th those are not concerns of yours. But this person had made that conclusion all on her own and didn't question anything beyond that. And then there is the... Uh, heuristic bias, that's spelled H-E-U-R-I-S-T-I-C, the heuristic bias, that's the tendency to use mental shortcuts or rules of thumb when making decisions rather than taking the time to carefully consider all the information. So an example might be when one hears about a plane crash uh, and the person becomes fearful of flying, even though flying is safer than driving. Well, you know, as a side note, I don't even think that flying uh, safety and driving are even comparable. They're two completely different things. And just because it, it may be true, and it is true, that few people, few, fewer people die in plane crashes than car crashes doesn't eliminate the fact that there is risks in everything. But I, but I think you get my point. Basically, someone hears about a plane crash and they're like, I don't wanna ever go on a plane again that mental shortcut, that heuristic bias would limit them. And then there's the hindsight bias. So the tendency to believe after a fact that events were more predictable than they actually were. A person will say, I knew things would turn out that way. Of course, most of the time they're wrong, but when they're seemingly right or they're projecting that they're right, they use that as a big deal. And then there's the self-serving bias, the tendency to attribute as successes to our own abilities and qualities while blaming external factors for our failures. I'm gonna go through examples of each of these different cognitive disorders in a moment, but I wanna go through a few more. And then there's the optimism bias, the tendency to, overly, to be overly optimistic about the future and to underestimate the likelihood of negative events or outcomes. This is where people might be overly confident of their, let's say, their business skills, uh, but then fail. And then there's, as I mentioned before, overgeneralization, the tendency to apply a general rule or principle to a specific situation without considering the unique factors and nuances of that situation. So again, if you overgeneralize and say, well, I don't like medical doctors, um, that was because, assuming you were right, you had some adverse interaction with a medical doctor in the past, and then you generalize this to all doctors. Or I've had women uh, say to me, some women say, oh, Dr. Wald, yeah, I know that female gynecologists are just better than male gynecologists. And I asked them, well, why is that? And, and they couldn't give me any kind of answer. I just know it, they are. How could they know? They certainly don't know every gynecologist that's a man. Um, or someone will say, well, I'm going to go to a, an acupuncturist um, that's from China. Um, you know, there are lousy acupuncturists in China. And there's nothing about coming from China that necessarily makes being an acupuncturist easier or better. Now, you might disagree with me. But if you disagree with me, you want to ask yourself why. And you probably are coming through uh, with an opinion from some sort of cognitive distortion, some conclusion you've drawn that has you listen to me in a certain way so that you disagree with me. And others, you might agree because you might have had an example of, let's say, a poor Asian uh, acupuncturist, and you're agreeing with my generalized statement, uh, if that was uh, that, you know, they're not as good or 
they may not be as talented as those in the United States. So my point here is that we want to catch ourselves with these cognitive distortions and we want to question our belief systems. And then there's what's known as category bias, the tendency to group people or things into categories based on limited or inaccurate information. So this happens a lot with religion. Someone will say that all Muslims are this way or all Jews are that way or all Italians are this way, et cetera, et cetera, uh, based on some personal experience that someone had, which may not have even been accurate and, and, and they just projected or filtered it in some way to draw some uh, conclusion. And then they group that person like let's say, for example, you were in a, an Uber and uh, you had an Indian driver and let's say the Indian driver took a wrong turn. So you might start to conclude due to category bias that you just do not want to drive in cars with uh, people of, uh, that are Indian. Uh, of course, as you listen to this, you realize the insanity of it and the inaccuracy of it. But many of us function this way. Sometimes we function this way unconsciously, and sometimes it's consciously. And then there's error bias, the tendency to view the present as being better or worse than the past without considering the full context of things. And then there is the very popular cognitive distortion known as the sunk cost fallacy. So that's the tendency to continue investing time, money, and effort into something because you've already sunk resources into it, even if it may not be the best choice. So an example of this would be, I was in uh, a movie. I'm embarrassed to say that I went to go see the Barbie movie with someone. I was sitting in the chair for maybe 10 minutes and I looked at the person I was with and I said, we need to get out of here now. And she said, um, yeah, but we, you know, we paid all this money for the tickets. I said, that's fine. I'd rather save minutes and hours of our life and let's get out of here, which we did. Uh, and I was very happy about. So um, the sunk cost fallacy might have been that I stayed in the movie theater because I paid for it, even though I felt it was a waste of life. And then there's the, what's known as the actor-observer bias, the tendency to attribute other people's behavior to their character or personality when attributing our own behavior to the situation or context. You know, there are different uh, personality types, uh, and what they call the five big personality types. Uh, one of them is openness. And another one is conscientiousness. And then there's the extrovert, introvert personality type. Then there's the agreeable personality type and the neurotic personality type. So let's say you're in a relationship with someone and something goes wrong and you attribute the behavior of that person, let's say by saying that they have a less agreeable personality type and they may very well have a less agreeable personality type, which would mean there's going to be a good deal of disagreements and maybe even arguing in that relationship. And you might say if you were in relationship to that person, well, they're the problem. Now, they may be the problem, but you might think they're the problem because you yourself may be a not particularly agreeable personality type. If you were an agreeable personality type, and you are with someone who is a not agreeable personality type, you might be able to let some of their statements just go because you're fairly agreeable. You say, well, okay, that's possible. I may not agree with you, but that's all good. I'm fine with that. And you let it go. So these underlying personality types definitely do affect behavior. They are filters. We basically filter the world through these personality types. I just want to name them for you again. Maybe write them down. And we tend to be a combination of these personality types. And this is how we view the world. So again, there's openness. There's conscientiousness. There's extrovert, introvert, agreeableness, and neurotic personality type. See, the neurotic personality type would have behaviors that are sort of OCD. 
they tend to be people, in my experience, in my field, who have extremely rigid neurotic diets. They um, are very good at doing without things. They are overly obsessed with their health, overly obsessed with being right. They're easily um, triggered and they tend to be ego focused as well as a bit of, uh, sometimes they tend to be, uh, they tend to act like infants. Uh, in other words, rather than having a rational conversation, they're prone to arguing. Like two-year-olds that don't have the words to express themselves, they act out emotionally by yelling and misbehaving. So I just gave you an example of one of those personality types and how they might show up in the world and how obviously that personality type and let's throw in some cognitive distortions, throw in some personality disorders, um, give them their view of the world. And another personality glitch is illusion of control, the tendency to believe that we have more control over events and outcomes than we actually do. And if we think that we have this control over these things and they don't happen, that leads to quite a bit of upset, particularly if someone operates out of the illusion of control, cognitive distortion on a regular basis. And then there's the bandwagon effect, the tendency to follow the crowd or do what others are doing rather than making your own independent decisions. This is what most people do. Let's say there's something going on politically. They jump on a bandwagon. Then you ask this person a couple of questions that go a little deeper and they just, they have nothing. That's when you know you've been, uh, you victimized yourself by the bandwagon effect. And then there's the halo effect, the tendency to make broad judgments based on one trait or characteristic of a person or a thing rather than the whole picture. So I had a client who was talking about a gentleman that she met and she said that she was not interested in, in him anymore. And I asked her why. And he says, well, you know, he shaved his head. And um, then she said, and you know, besides that, He's this way, he's that way, he's another way. And I said, you know, you never ever mentioned these other negative things about this man. Are you sure that you're not just coming up with him now to justify in your mind wanting to end it because you just, you aren't attracted to him, let's say, because he has no hair. Long story short, this is exactly what she was doing. And when she realized that, and she also, uh, we had a conversation about, you know, does a person who's clean shaven or bald, does that affect his character? And you know, is that something that she couldn't um, look past? And then she came to the realization that she could easily look past that. So uh, she was ready to throw everything away. And then there's the, what's called effect heuristic. Where effect heuristic is the tendency to let our emotions influence our decisions rather than considering all available information. So people will be uh, exposed to something and they'll simply say, well, you know, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, and they make an emotional decision rather than actually looking into the thing that they're saying they don't wanna do. And then there's framing or what's called the framing effect, the tendency to influence um, by, by the way of information uh, that's presented rather than the information itself. I'll give you an example, a personal one. Um, I, I used to listen to Tony Robbins, you know, the sort of self-help guru. And um, I started uh, n to not listen and not enjoying listening to him because I felt that he, um, uh, his voice was just uh, irritating to me. Um, and then I invented other reasons why I thought, well, maybe he wasn't worth listening to. And then I was able to notice myself doing this. I said, well, I used to really like a lot of his work. So I listened again and I listened to the words that he said. And I realized that I still did like most of what he spoke about. And I almost threw that away because I didn't like his voice. And then there's the salience bias. Now what salience bias is, is the tendency to overestimate the importance 
of information that is most salient or prominent rather than considering all the information. So you might hear something, let's say again on the news and you're like, yes, I agree with that. Let's go for that. Uh, But you don't really think it through. So I had one person who brought this example up. They said, you know, I was very much into um, renewable energy in the form of uh, windmills until I learned that most of the windmill parts come from China and we're having problems with China that might not be a good idea to rely on windmills. Uh, Windmills have a fairly short lifespan and very little, if, if any, of their components are recyclable, so they're dumped. And also that windmills kill lots of birds. And also she said that Windmills, uh, for example, she gave an example in Africa where a large portion of land they filled with windmills because there was this environmental, uh, um, governmental strategy to, in, in, uh, to incorporate renewable sources of energy in Africa. And then she said, well, you know, I looked into it and the windmills produce very little energy. And what Africa needs is food. So that land would be much better off for food. So she realized that in many cases, she just wasn't okay with windmills anymore. And uh, she had originally just thought, oh, it's windmills are good because they produce energy. They produce very little energy, uh, according to her. And uh, therefore, she didn't look into this de- more detailed information. And once she had... She had cured herself of the salience uh, salience uh, bias uh, because she no longer, she overestimated originally the simple statement that windmills are good and looked in deeper and thought for her, no, not so much. And then there's the conjunction uh, fallacy, the, the tendency to overestimate the probability of a conjunction of two events even if the probability of each event is very low. In other words, connecting things together where there are no connections there in reality. And then there's the availability cascade. The tendency to believe a piece of information is true because many other people believe it, even if there's no evidence to support it. Now, I'm quickly going through a bunch of these uh, cognitive distortions, and I'm going to give you examples of many of them in a few minutes. I want to remind you too that if you go to my website at drmichaelwalt.com, drmichaelwalt.com to the blog section, I have all the notes posted for you to download. And you can send me your uh, comments uh, and uh, show ideas to my email, which is at info at blooddetective.com, info at blooddetective.com, or you can call me at 914 552 one, four, four, two. Um, and then there's the over-justification effect, the tendency to attribute our behavior to external factors rather than taking responsibility for our own choices. Well, I acted, I yelled because this happened or I did what I did because that happened. Well, things happen and then there's our choice on how to react. So many people blame the outward event and do not take responsibility for their own actions. So let me give you, let me give you some more practical, real-life examples of some of these cognitive distortions uh, in, your real, in real life. So for example, confirmation bias. So what is that again? Confirmation bias is the tendency to research or interpret and remember information in a way that confirms your pre-existing beliefs or your pre-existing hypothesis. That can lead people to ignore or dismiss information that contradicts their beliefs while selectively accepting information that supports them. So an example would be, suppose, suppose a person strongly believes that vac- uh, vaccines are harmful and causes autism. They may actively seek out and focus on studies or antidotes that support this belief while disregarding scientific evidence that might prove otherwise. And by the way, that's just an example. I'm not going to discuss vaccinations at the moment, but I wanted to give you an idea of how we, of how confirmation bias works. 
And then there's anchoring bias. So anchoring bias occurs when individuals rely too heavily on the first piece of information that they receive when they're making decisions or judgments. So this information uh, serves as an anchor, you might say, uh, influencing subsequent thoughts uh, and decisions. So an example of anchoring bias would be in a negotiation. Uh, where the seller, let's say, sets a high price for a product, the buyer may be anchored to that price and have difficulty accepting any lower offers, even if they're reasonable. And then what about availability bias? Availability bias refers to the tendency to rely on readily available examples of information when making judgments or decisions. So People tend to overestimate the likelihood of events or situations based on how easily they can recall relevant examples from memory. So here's an example of availability bias. So after hearing, uh, let's say, news reports about several shark attacks, an individual might become fearful of swimming in the ocean despite the fact that the probability of being attacked by a shark is extremely low. I certainly understand that availability bias because ever since watching the movie Jaws as a kid, I've had a fear of going into the ocean, even though I know statistically that it's extremely rare. Of course, someone else might say, well, I had that fear went to the, and went into the ocean and I got bit by a shark. You see, I was right. But that was just a random occurrence. And then there's hindsight bias. So Hindsight bias is the inclination to perceive past events as more predictable than they actually were at the time. So after an event has occurred, an individual tends to believe that they knew it all along and overestimate their ability to protect uh, the outcome. So so an example would be, uh, let's say, after the stock market crash, people may claim they knew it was going to happen and overlook the fact that they did not take any action to protect their investments beforehand. In other words, they didn't know it was going to happen. And then there's the self-serving bias. And I want to remember, I want to remind everyone listening that you want to hear these a couple of times. Then you're going to want to read those notes on the website and and actually try to maybe pick a few of these uh, cognitive distortions, maybe two or three of them, and listen for them uh, during your day let's say for a couple of days, and you will find that they're all over the place. And then there's self-serving bias. So self-serving bias is the tendency to attribute positive outcomes to internal factors, such as someone's abilities, while attributing any negative uh, outcomes to external events like luck or circumstance. So it allows people to protect their self-esteem and maintain a a positive self-image. But an example of self-serving bias would be, uh, let's see, a a student, let's say, who performs well on an exam may attribute their success to their intelligence and hard work, while attributing any poor performance to factors like a difficult test or unfair grading system. Another very, very important common cognitive distortion is optimism bias. So optimism bias refers to the tendency to believe that positive events are much more likely to happen to oneself compared to others, while negative events are less likely. It can lead to individuals to underestimate risks and overestimate their chances of success. An example of this would be someone uh, may believe that they have a lower risk of developing a serious illness compared to others, even if they engage in unhealthy behaviors such as uh, smoking or poor diet. And then I want to mention overgeneralization again because this is a big one. So overgeneralization occurs when individuals draw broad conclusions based on limited or isolated experiences. Uh, It involves making sweeping generalizations about a group or situation based on a single event or a, a few examples. So we might hear in the news, for example, that a certain group of people of a certain ethnic origin committed a heinous crime, and then people listening to this, and because the news over-focuses on it, creating this narrative, people draw conclusions that all people like that are a problem. And listen, we all do this. The thing is to know when you're doing it and to stop doing it by logical thinking. 
And then I wanna make mention again of the sunk cost fallacy. So that's where there's a tendency to continue investing your time and effort or money into something because you've already uh, invested resources into it, uh, even when it makes no sense to, uh, or rational sense to continue. So people often feel reluctant to abandon something they've invested in, in terms of time or money, regardless of um, its potential for success or failure. So an example of sunk cost fallacy would be continuing, again, to watch a movie you find boring or, or unenjoyable simply because you've already paid for it. And I reviewed that example, that real example of myself earlier on. And then there's what's known as illusion of control. The illusion of control is the belief that individuals have more control over events or outcomes than they actually do, which, which lead people to believe that their actions can influence random events. This is a big one. So an example would be a person might believe that they have a higher chance of winning the lottery if they choose their own numbers rather than using random ones, even though the odds are the same. And then there is the bandwagon effect. So the bandwagon effect occurs when individuals adopt belief beliefs or behaviors because many others are doing so. So people tend to conform to popular opinions or trends to fit it, to fit in or avoid being left out. So an example of that, of the bandwagon effect, would be buying a particular brand of, of clothing because it's currently trendy and popular, even if the individual does not generally like the style. And then there's the halo effect. Again, the halo effect is the tendency to form an over overall positive impression of a person based on one positive trait or characteristic. And that influences how you perceive and judge individuals. And that can lead to very biased evaluations. So an example would be assuming that the person who's, let's say, physically attractive must be intelligent and kind without any evidence supporting their assumptions. We tend to project upon other people's stories. And then we are so confused and disappointed when the person doesn't act the way we thought they should. And I've just got to mention again the affect heuristic where the, the affect heuristic re refers to the mental shortcut where individuals rely on their emotions or their feelings when making judgments or decisions rather than engaging in deliberate reasoning. So it involves using emotional responses, the heuristic effect, uh, as a guide for evaluating risks and benefits. So an example might be choosing not to invest in a particular stock because it makes you feel anxious even if there's no rational basis for the feeling. And then there's what's known as the conjunction fallacy. The conjunction fallacy occurs when individuals believe that the co-occurrence of two specific events is more likely than either event occurring alone despite it being statistically improbable. So it violates the principle or principles, I should say, of probability. That's the conjunction fallacy. So an example would be believing that a person is both a lawyer and an environmental act activist is more likely than them being just the lawyer, even though being a lawyer alone is much more probable. And then there's the availability cascade cognitive distortion. So an availability cascade happens when a belief or an idea is wi widely accepted solely because it's repeated frequently and gains public attention. So the repetition creates a perception of consensus, leading people to believe it must be true. So a an example of availability cascade would be a false rumor that, that spreads rapidly on social media platforms, leading many people to believe it without verifying its accuracy. This happens most of the time Many people simply do not think. And then there's the over-justification effect. So the over-justification effect occurs when individuals lose intrinsic motivation for an activity after receiving external reward or incentives for performing it. So the external reward undermined their internal drive and enjoyment. So an example of the over-justification effect in action would be let's say a child who loves drawing but loses interest in art, uh, if they're uh, constantly rewarded with prizes or praise for their drawings, as the external reward replace their intrinsic motivation. And then there's the fundamental attribution error. The fundamental attribution error 
refers to the tendency of act of of to to attribute to others, I should say, behavior to internal characteristics or traits that underestimate the influence of situational factors. It involves overemphasizing personal qualities rather than considering external circumstances. So an example of fundamental attribution error would be assuming that someone who failed an exam did so because they're lazy or unintelligent without considering factors such as illness or personal difficulties that may have affected their performance. And certainly many teachers and and college professors make this error by thinking that the person who doesn't do well, they they didn't study. And again, sometimes that's true, but often there's other reasons that a, that a person would do unwell on an exam. And in the last few minutes we have, I want to review again the personality types because, again, they play a significant role in how uh, individuals perceive and interact uh, with the world around them. And, and there are several widely recognized personality traits that contribute to these differences, including openness and conscientiousness, uh, conscientiousness, extroversion, introversion, agreeableness, and eroticism. And each of these traits influence various aspects of an individual's thoughts, emotions, and behaviors shaping their worldview. If you just are mindful of just these personality traits and uh, which ones you might have, and you may have more than one, I think you're going to be a lot, a lot happier and a lot more content. So number one is, is openness. So, so openness is a personality trait that's characterized by an individual's inclination uh, towards novelty and creativity and intellectual curiosity. They're open. So people high in openness tend to be imaginative, they're open-minded, they're receptive to new experiences, and they have a broad range of interests uh, and are willing to explore unconventional ideas and perspectives. So this trait influences how individuals perceive the world by allowing them to embrace diverse viewpoints and consider alternate possibilities. And open individuals are more likely to appreciate art, uh, value cultural diversity, and, and engage in intellectual discussions. So people who have, let's say, political conversations and are immediately reactive, they're not open. They tend to be angry. They tend to be um, closed-minded. You'll start to see these things yourself. The next one is conscientiousness. So the conscientiousness refers to the degree of organization and responsibility and self-discipline an individual possesses. And people high in conscientiousness are typically um, diligent, they're reliable, they're goal-oriented, they have a strong sense of duty, and they strive for achievement. Uh, the conscientious personality trait influences how individuals see the world by shaping their approach to tasks and decision-making processes and overall behavior. So conscientious people tend to plan ahead. They follow rules very diligently. Uh, They prioritize uh, long-term goals over immediate gratification. The extrovert, on the other hand, is characterized by sociability, assertiveness, and a preference for external stimulation. They're extroverted. Extroverts thrive in social situations and gain energy from interacting at others, being the center of attention. They tend to be outgoing. They tend to be talkative. uh, They enjoy being the center of attention, as I mentioned. And extroversion influences how individuals perceive the world by shaping their social interactions and preferences to external stimuli. So, for example, extroverts often seek out social gatherings, enjoy networking opportunities, and they feel energized by engaging with others. And then there is agreeableness. So agreeableness refers to an individual's tendency to be compassionate, cooperative, and considerate towards others. So people high in agreeableness are typically empathetic, they're trusting, and they value harmonious relationships. They prioritize maintaining social harmony and avoiding conflict. So agreeableness influences how individuals perceive the world by shaping their interpersonal interactions as well, their communication styles, their willingness to cooperate with others. And agreeable individuals are much more likely to seek consensus, uh, prioritize others' needs, and and engage in in, uh, pro-social behaviors or very social behaviors. So you can see that your 
personality type or combination of personality type is what gives you your world. And then there's neuroticism. So neuroticism is characterized by emotional instability, anxiety, and a tendency towards negative emotions such as fear, sadness, or anger. Individuals high in neuroticism are more prone to experiencing mood swings, worry, uh, even excessive worry, and they react very strongly to stressors. Uh, neuroticism influences how individuals see the world by shaping their emotional responses. So highly neurotic individuals might perceive situations as much more threatening or stressful than they actually are. Uh, that would be, that leads to you know, heightened anxiety and negative interpretations of events. So it's important to note that these personality traits don't exist in isolation, but, but rather interact with one another to form a, a unique personality profile for, for a person. So for example, someone uh, can be both open-mindedness, open-minded and conscientious, or introverted and agreeable. So the combination of these traits further shape an individual's world view. So in short, personality types such as openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, introversion, agreeableness and eroticism, along with the different cognitive disorders uh, that I mentioned during this uh, podcast, significantly influence how individuals perceive and interact in the world. They are what determines how you interact with the world. So I want to thank you all for listening to this particular podcast. I think it's one of the most important I've ever done. Uh, You're listening to Ask the Blood Detective. My name is Dr. Michael Wald. Thank you again for listening. You can reach me at 914-552-1442. You can email me at info at blooddetective.com. And you can check out the website at www.drmichaelwald.com. It was a pleasure. Take care, everyone.